introduce you again. So, Christina Hickman from London, United Kingdom. Uh, one sec, I didn't see the title here. So, bringing transparency to all site assessment, the importance of including confounders when building artificial intelligence based support tools to quantify our site viability. So I think we'll ask you to start. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, all of you, to being here and in the first session of the day. Thank you, Eshri, for selecting this abstract for the talk. I do have conflicts of interest uh, which are uh, directly relevant to this talk. I am the chair of the AI Fertility Society. I'm also the founder of the co-founder of the ASRM Special Interest Group for Artificial Intelligence uh, in Fertility. I am uh, a founder for Ovum Care uh, and um, the Chief Scientific Officer at APRA City. I'm a lecturer on artificial intelligence and embryology at Imperial College London. And the one that's most relevant for today is that I'm the Chief Clinical Officer for Fertility. So why do we want to assess eggs? Well, there, there are three main stages that we want to use uh, egg assessment for. Firstly, for the egg freezers. They want to know, have I collected enough eggs? Do I need to go for another egg collection? Because they need to make that decision now when they're freezing, not later on, 10 years, 15 years later, when they're going to be warming. At that stage, having that knowledge is too late. Then we have the IVF patients. The IVF patients need to have uh, the reassurance, we need to manage their expectations based on the quality of their sperm, the quality of their eggs, so that they understand what is happening next. This is very powerful to help um, them navigate, especially when they're doomed to receive bad news. So this helps them cope better in that scenario. It also allows us to personalize the clinical strategy, which is specific for their quality of egg. And then you get have donation. Within the donation, we, we split eggs between recipients and donors. How do we ensure that both sides have equal chance of uh, leading on to a live birth? So how do we assess eggs today? Well, naturally, the gut instinct that we have as an embryologist is to try and see what are the anomalies that, are, that we can visually interpret in the eggs. And we already have lots of publications on this, mostly from Thomas Ebner, Laura Rienzi, amongst others. And they have listed abnormal zona pellucida, abnormal shape, refractile bodies, vacuoles, granular, um, uh, granular cytoplasms, cirques. All of these are, are characteristics that we can see. But when we start thinking that we're supposed to be making our interpretations based on evidence-based medicine, when you look at the evidence, we don't have a rationale to be interpreting uh, our prediction of, of, of uh, all site viability based on these features. In fact, all of these which are in green, there is no evidence to suggest that we should be including that in our interpretation. The ones in blue, there is some statistical significance, but there's no clinical significance in using them in interpretation. And when you look at CIRCs, for instance, where we do have evidence to, suge to suggest that this should be considered, CIRCs only occur in 1% of your eggs. So now we start asking ourselves, is an ugly egg a bad egg? And the evidence suggests that that's not necessarily the case. So the next thing we can do is go, okay, so what about the good-looking eggs? What do we do with the good-looking eggs? Can we tell? Where, what good-looking egg will lead to a blastocyst and which one won't. And I'm going to be honest with you, I'm looking at these four eggs up there. I have the answer in the bottom, but when you look closely, they don't look that dissimilar to me. I couldn't tell them apart. There's many examples I can show you of different embryologists who try to quantify how well can we as embryologists predict which of these eggs will become a blastocyst and which ones won't. This is one example from, from Bear uh, from Stanford University. From, he presented here at Ashury not that long ago. Uh, and he shows that it's pretty much, I might as well flick a coin, then look at the egg and make an assessment. So artificial intelligence is ideally suited for this type of problem. It can see things that potentially we can see. It can analyze every pixel in that image and start looking for patterns that we as embryologists might not be able to identify. 
The problem is that although we have several tools out there and several publications on how to use AI, I mean, by publications, they're mostly abstracts, um, we don't really have uh, an assessment of how confounders contribute to, to this uh, prediction of efficacy, of, of prediction of viability. So things like if you've taken the image before ICSI or after ICSI, it, did sperm quality get taken into account? We all know that sperm quality contributes to blastulation. It's not just about the egg. What about the patient age, the source, if it's donor or not? What about the morphology of the egg itself? And the reality is that the current methods involve you taking the dish with your eggs over to an inverted microscope and doing the assessment one egg at a time, which allows for human error to happen in terms of have I assessed the right egg to the one that I have made, uh, numbered one, two, or three. You also have the challenge that you're outside an incubator. And we all know that eggs are extremely vulnerable to the environment. So we designed a study to assess how these confounders affect the ability of AI to predict blastulation based on all site images alone. We looked at all site donor age, we looked at all site dysmorphism, we looked at own eggs or donated eggs, so the source of the eggs, we looked at the quality of the sperm, and we looked at a comparison between an image taken before or after ICSI. So within this methodology, we were able to use uh, an algorithm uh, or the Chloe OQ, so, or Chloe All Site Quality Insights, and we did this assessment twice, once before and once after the ICSI. This was all performed inside a time-lapse incubator. So this allowed for the eggs to be assessed within the, the safety of an incubator environment. And the individual wells within the incubator allowed the full traceability to be 100% infallible. The, uh, the egg source, uh, I have here the splits of each of the cohort groups that we analyzed, own or donated, the different age groups uh, that, that we categorized. We use the HFEA cutoffs. And the sperm quality, we look at it in terms of how the clinic had categorized in terms of whether it was what we consider good quality sperm because it was donated sperm, whether it was normal spermic sperm combined with sperm donations, we consider that a second layer of, of quality, uh, or whether uh, specifically the patient has been categorized as male factor or abnormal sperm samples were documented. First thing we noticed is that now I could tell the difference between the good eggs and the bad eggs more clearly, supported by a tool that gave me either a high or a low score. So it, it became clearer the interpretation of which of those eggs were viable, which before I couldn't do. Next, we were able to identify that this information, we were able to use it as a biomarker. We actually put this, this is gonna be a topic of a different talk, but I just wanted to introduce the concepts that we could use the score of the egg as a way to monitor the different methods of stimulation, the different methods of egg collection practice, the different operators doing all the procedures that happen before the ICSI. We're also able to interpret that information to allow the patient to have access to that information. So they were able to see pictures of the eggs, have a report that fully explains what's happening, which helps build trust and empowers the patient. What about the numbers? Well, the first thing that was really interesting for me, I didn't expect to see this, was that we actually had a difference in, in OQ score between a pre-ICSI egg and a post-ICSI egg, and this reached statistical significance. So, for me, there were two things going on here. Is this because of the difference in the quality of the egg before and after? Uh, it's two, we were taking the very first image after ICSI. This was minutes after an ICSI procedure. There isn't really enough time for any of the biological aspects to start affecting the imagery of the egg. Next thing that we looked at was all of these factors which did not contribute towards the quality of the egg as assessed by the OQ score. So the egg source, the age groups, and another one that was surprising for me, the sperm quality was not a factor. 
we didn't just look at the impact on the OK score, we also wanted to understand what was the impact on the efficacy of prediction. And none of these factors, the egg source, the age group of the sperm quality, contributed towards the efficacy of prediction um, from the OK score or prediction of blastulation. However, pre-ICSI and post-ICSI did significantly differ from each other. So this, for me, reminds us that the post-ICSI was a lot more predictive than the pre-ICSI with regards to whether this egg would become a blastocyst or not. We also looked at other clinics. So we started with a single center. We have now expanded the project and we have three different centers independent in different geographies to see how the, this, this particular tool generalize across different centers. And as you can see here, it ranged from 21 to 40% improvement in prediction compared to random. Remember, previous studies have demonstrated that embryologists are below random. So the average was 22% improvement. So in summary, the AI tools are predictive of blastulation but they should be built in a way that they account for these confounders. They need to take into account whether it's pre or post ICSI images, especially if we're gonna be using these tools for egg freezers. We found no evidence for sperm quality or site uh, source or donor age to be uh, considered as confound uh, confounders, but this could be the case for this particular algorithm as these were considered when the algorithm was built. We need to do further studies and other algorithms that are available in the market. Chloe OQ is predictive of blastulation and improves uh, over random by 22% uh, our, our ability to assess whether an embryo, an oocyte will become um, a blastocyst or not. And we were able to demonstrate that this was the case in different clinics, in different geographies around the world. I'd like to thank uh, Institute of Life in Greece, CRGH in the UK, and Alpha in Malaysia for leading this study, and also the fertility team who made this study possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Beautiful data. Um, so questions? Hello. Good morning. Uh, it's an amazing study. Hi, uh, Brock Oscars and Paralabs. Uh, so my question is kind of like mixed with comments. So I have a feeling the, the procedure itself is a confounding factor. Uh, so, but I think even you don't put, you don't inject sperm, you will get the same results. I, I agree with like you. Like mock up ICSI, the procedural, I think it's like, I call it a normalization. So your eggs are normalized after ICSI. So for algorithms to run uh, makes easier, I think. Yeah, I, I agree there are the confounders to consider. So looking at different embryologists within, but in fact, this is why I introduced the concept of the KPI. I think this would be a beautiful tool for us to be able to see the difference between the egg qualities. If, if we're doing the assessment post ICSI and help this uh, identify which are the embryologists that need further support. And uh, I would actually predict that potentially this might be a more useful tool than the generation. Uh, it might be a more sensitive biomarker. Uh, so it is definitely something that we'd be looking at. Uh, so not just to monitor the different clinical practices, but also the embryologist uh, ICSI, if this happened to be used uh, uh, post ICSI. But especially if we do this pre-freeze and post-freeze, we can also use it to monitor our vitrification and warming capabilities. Uh, so the potential for a quality control and quality assurance is there. We haven't demonstrated it yet, but I do believe that's, that would that to be the case. So uh, we have microphone five first, uh, and we're running out a bit of time, so maybe a short question. Uh, P Peter Ill Illingworth, Australia. Uh, this is certainly very interesting work, but it's only quite good it certainly wouldn't allow you to set out what you set in your introduction where you can allow women to identify whether they've frozen enough eggs. How do you think you'll get to that point? Completely agree with you, it's the first step. 
Um, but it is certainly better than right now, where all we're saying to the patient is, you've got an oval egg, and I think that's bad, which is currently what we hear um, embryologists say to, to their doctors. We don't have a rationale to be uh, making those comments at the moment either, and, and they are happening in clinical practice. So at least now we have something that is a bit more data-driven. We will be expanding this further so that we'll be able to demonstrate in terms of post-warming, in terms of looking at the specifically targeting the three objectives at the beginning. But certainly for the third objective, in terms of splitting and chance of blastulation between the donor and the recipient, I do think we have a rationale there. Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, Christina, thank you. No, no, sorry, we have microphone two, and I don't, I don't think we have time for more questions after that. I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, yeah. Sarah Kresha from Canada. Thank you for you a nice presentation and good data. I have just two questions. One, um, so for cytoplasmic maturation or nuclear maturation, do you have anything is looking for, because, you know, it depends on the time of the stripping. Maybe you're going to miss it. Yeah. The other one for SER. SER, you have two different versions. For the hyperstimulation, Young donors, you can see lots of SCR, or in the older population, and you can see all the difference result for blastulation. I love that question. Um, not that I don't love the others, I love the others too, but this one in particular, because we are now just thinking, going, what other confounders can we look for? And we certainly, the next step, we're definitely focusing on looking at not just the cytoplasma maturity, which we, we could look with biofringence, for instance, but we could. Uh, well, that's nuclear maturity, but it gives an indication. But also we were wanting to make an assessment of the day of stimulation. Uh, how long were they stimulated for? Were they overstimulated or understimulated? What is the folliculogram profile that we see with these particular patients? Um, and see what, how that impacts on the OQ score. So certainly we, we'd be very interested in any of you have any other uh, biomarkers associated with the egg that we could cross-relate. Please come talk to me after because I, I would like to expand this further. Looking, I believe in looking at the egg from different angles is the way to go. This is a very cool angle to look at, but all the previous speakers presented other options, and I'd love to hear some more, especially if there are markers associated with maturity of the cytoplasm. Thank you. Okay, this is a quick question. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, th thank you so much, Christina. Um, is your tool yet predictive of embryo grading, any level of embryo yeah. grading, or just viability? So we do have the data for that in terms of the, so not just forming a blastocyst, but forming a good quality blastocyst. I was kind of saving that for the next conference, uh, but e effectively there, there is a, a connection there as well. Um, but we, uh, we also want to make the connection between the OQ score, which is our egg score, and the EQ score, which is our embryo score. So we're certainly looking and building those connections and going beyond as well. So we certainly want to go all the way to, to live birth, neuploidy, live birth, all the interims in the middle. But obviously the further we go away from the egg, the more confounders we're going to have to control for. And this is the challenge that, that uh, all of us face in any of these predictive tools. Thank you. Thank you. We Thank actually you. have two questions from the online as well, from sure. Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous. Uh, and the first one is, can this be applied to conventional IVF? To con so, um, in terms of the application for conventional IVF, uh, the challenge we have here is that you'd have to strip the egg um, and then do the assessment. Uh, so, I would say no, unless you're doing short IVF, which is a common practice, uh, particularly I've seen it very commonly used in China and Japan. Uh, it's not common in the Western side of the world. But if you're doing short IVF, then we could, because that would be no different to us doing the post ICSI. But if you're doing an overnight IVF, uh, that would be now a zygote assessment. So maybe that would be the ZQ. Maybe, maybe that would be the next tool that we might be working on. Uh, but yes, um, not, um, not as useful for, for that. And we have another one, this is, so this is the last one now. Uh, thank you, Christina, for another fantastic topic. Did you consider different embryologists after ICSI? I assume how they do their ICSI, how they perform. Yep. Yes, yeah. so that is definitely something we're looking at. The particular data set that we collected didn't capture that. It just wasn't in the scope of this particular study. But this is certainly something that we're focusing on, particularly on the KPI side and the KPI objectives, not just the different uh, practitioners, but also the different ICSI rigs, the different media they're using, the different oil they're using, the different uh, brand of uh, needles they're using. So we're certainly going to be expanding to all of these different contributors, uh, and I, I, we think it could be a powerful tool for that as well. 
Yeah, so that will be the embryologist score. <laughs> the embryologist score, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will move on. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.